Hi, everyone. Thank you for being so patient. Um, thank you for coming to GASA's event. For those of you that don't know, GASA stands for Cuban American Student Association. And today our event's called uh, Cuba-US Relations, Will Liberty and Democracy Be Served? And we have the pleasure of having our speaker, Julian Schilling, who is the director of the blog, Patria de Martí. And there's his email if you have any questions. Um, so a little bit about Julio. He is a sociologist, political scientist, writer, lecturer, and the director of the online political forum, Patria de Martí. He was born in La Habana, Cuba, and sought out exile with his family at the age of six. Exile with his family at the age of six. He has a master's in political science from Florida International University in Miami, Florida, where he currently lives. He is a member of the American Political Science Association, the International Political Science Association, and the Pen Club of Cuban Writers in Exile. He is the author of the book titled Dictadura y su Paradigmas, Porque algunas dictaduras se caen y otros no, which means dictatorships and their paradigms. Why do some dictatorships fall and others do not? This is a detailed work consisting of two volumes. This book has received excellent reviews and comments because of its meticulous work that examines, as the subtitle suggests, why some dict dictatorships fall and others do not. His articles and essays have been reproduced in print and online all over the world, including the United States, Latin America, and Europe. He is currently conducting research for a book on Cuba and its prospects for democratization. As a lecturer, he regularly participates in forums and events generating discussion. His blog, Patria de Martí, co-sponsors the Symposiums for a Free World, a series of conferences designed to promote greater political awareness in regards to liberty and democracy. These symposiums are held nine times a year, each with a different theme and various panelists. <coughs> Since 2006, he has been directing Patria de Martí, which brings together the work of several authors selected for their contribution to the promotion and preservation, 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 I'm sorry, <laughs> of liberty and democracy. This blog has won the Premio Derechos Humanos Libertad 2015 award from the Asociación por la Paz Continental. Yesterday, at the Bandera Cubana event in Boston City Hall, Mr. Schilling was giving an award for his dedication and passion for Cuban issues. We are very excited to, join, for have, to have him join us today at Boston College to discuss the new Cuban-American relations and will liberty and democracy be served. Please give a warm welcome to our wonderful guest speaker, Julio Schilling. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Lourdes, uh, Talavera, uh, and CASA, the Cuban American Student Association, uh, Bandera Cubana, which I facilitated yesterday's event, and Boston College for uh, having me here. I want to thank all of you for making time. I know with competing issues and in school, how much uh, valuable your time is. And I want to thank God for allowing this opportunity and giving me this opportunity to be here uh, with you. Recently, uh, the United States reestablished uh, relations with, uh, with Cuba. Many have seen this as a favorable uh, issue, favorable something that will have consequences of a favorable nation. I want to go over with you that uh, scenario a little bit and bring into perspective a little bit of history because it basically was just a couple of days short of 54 years since the relations between the United States and Cuba were severe. First, one has to understand you know, the background of why they were, uh, they were broken. It's important to, and I don't want to dwell on, on, on the historical aspect, but the truth is sometimes the present uh, you, you can't really tune in on it if you don't bring into context its historical uh, place. The current regime was part of a coalition that was fighting 
previous dictatorship to gain access to power. The U.S. did play an extremely important role in two main aspects regarding uh, that uh, belligerent campaign. Number one, in public relations, uh, the American press, particularly the New York Times, uh, did a tremendous job in promoting the guerrillas that were in the, uh, in the uh, hills. Fidel Castro once said that he's, he got his job at the New York Times. And essentially that was true because they really weren't that many uh, insurgents and Herbert Matthews facilitated, gave them an avenue of discourse uh, to the world that uh, would not have been uh, possible had a newspaper with the uh, weight of the New York Times not done so. And the second thing is an embargo. I'm talking about an arms embargo that the United States placed on the previous uh, dictatorship, the Batista regime. This embargo uh, essentially occurred uh, right <coughs> when there was a spring offensive that was to uh, lend a somewhat uh, damaging role to the uh, guerrillas. Well, it never materialized because of the arms embargo. And that occurred months before the Batista regime uh, collapsed. Cuba's dictatorial path has to be, again, understood that Cuba is the only regime where it is communist and yet it denied having a communist underpinning. There is no other case in history that reached power, a, a Marxist <coughs> movement that reached power that explicitly denied its uh, communist uh, underpinning. The fact that it was a coalition was, you know, to an extent uh, part of it, but the movement, the 26th of July movement was predominant, especially once Batista left, and even then it articulated very strongly that it was not <coughs> communist, that it was democratic. Within less than two years, Cuba was in fact, in fact a totalitarian state. In other words, the unions had ceased to exist. There was no free press. Uh, there were no other legal uh, political parties. Obviously, there were no elections. So, in effect, in, in tremendous, tremendous speed, in less than that time, Cuba was officially uh, totalitarian and was beginning to receive a Soviet aid. The aid that the Soviet Union gave Cuba in 30 years was less, I'm sorry, was more in current uh, dollars than what was given in the Marshall aid after World War II. We're talking of approximately $10 billion a year that was funneled to the the Castro regime. And immediately upon uh, gaining power, the class war struggle that Cuba promoted throughout the hemisphere began immediately. There were ventures into Venezuela, ventures into uh, Central America and South America, the training of personnel with those objectives. Because again, uh, the notion of class struggle has international implications. In other words, they were being consistent with uh, an ideological uh, belief system that necessitated that type of action. And, and it was enormous recourse precisely why the Soviet Union was uh, given this huge amount of money. At the same time, U.S. property was being confiscated. Uh, in today's dollars, that amounts to over $7 billion that was confiscated. And, and nationalization processes are legitimate, but there's an, an, an indemnity, in other words, there's a payment. You, you, you pay the person or the company when you confiscate, uh, when you nationalize a property. Well, this did not happen in Cuba. They were confiscated, and, and uh, that was that close to 6,000 U.S. Uh, persons or businesses were uh, confiscated. This placed uh, with the Cuban model within a tremendous dilemma. In other words, it had a high cost of maintenance 
a high cost of maintenance internally as far as keeping in line because remember every dictatorship is able to maintain itself in power only if it is successful in stifling opposition in other words if it is limiting the ability of the opposition to challenge you and when you add that with the delirious experiment of complete collectivization of a, of a country I mean there isn't you know one example where there's been a success in this and the more it's been collectivized well then are the worse the results I mean Cambodia uh, the Great Famine in China and, and so forth so the high cost of maintenance triggered with a low uh, productivity placed on the Castro communist regime an enormous uh, task to bear. That's where the Soviet aid was crucial. Well, the United States reacted. It reacted by limiting assistance to Cuban opposition leaders. It helped uh, finance an, an invasion. And all this was consistent with uh, OAS Charter, the, the Organization of American States Charter and the Rio Treaty that basically said that you know, no uh, communist dictatorship was going to be tolerated in this, in this continent. This was consistent. So the United States, in essence, was not uh, acting without any legitimate uh, basis. There was you know, uh, agreements that specific, specifically called for the confronting of uh, Marxist regimes in this continent. The embargo, which again, you hear from uh, many, they're called blockade, but this is a euphemism that in essence is a propaganda piece that the regime puts out and basically people that either support it or have to be awfully ignorant to be able to substantiate that because there is no blockade unless we redefine what blockade is, you know, you circle and circle and somebody. Cuba trades with over 170 nations. Uh, the unilateral decision of one country, the United States, to not trade with a country, not give it access to its credit, is not a, a blockade. It's sanctions uh, that can be called an embargo. And the United States was faced with the fact that missiles were placed in Cuba. Uh, this was extremely challenging and and I'm bringing this historical context because, you know, the fact that relations, again, when, when we get to that, we're going to get to that real quick, uh, comes up, you just can't erase that with an imaginary picture that the problem has disappeared. And those missiles were aimed at the United States. Later, a pact between Kennedy and Khrushchev, which in effect, in exchange for the U.S. removing its missiles from Turkey and a guarantee that there would be no serious attempt to overthrow the Castro government, well, in effect, uh, they agreed to remove the, uh, the missiles. The embargo, it must be understood that this has, it has not been a consistent policy of, of the United States government. It's, Dependent upon who was in the White House, politics changed. For example, a President Ford in 1975, in effect, loosened the embargo by allowing U.S. companies in other countries to sell to Cuba. President Carter loosened the embargo, allowing travel and remittances in 1977-78. President Reagan tightened the embargo by limiting spending, limiting travel. And President George Bush, the father, tightened the embargo by signing the Cuban Democracy Act, which in effect gave Congress the ability, because remember, up to this point, the embargo and whatever happened was strictly uh, executive orders. In other words, the president could you know, unilaterally make these decisions. Well, uh, the Cuban Democracy Act, the 1992-93, in effect, gave Congress that, uh, that ability. President Clinton both tightened it in one end and loosened it in the other, allowing uh, exports, allowing uh, food to be sold to Cuba. And after 
the Castro regime shot down, a, you know, aircraft killing American citizens. And then they introduced a tightening of the embargo. But he had loosened it first. President Bush, son, tightened the embargo in with President Obama. So they've all done these things by way generally of executive orders. But this has not been a consistent uh, policy. Certainly nothing like we've seen with what happened with South Africa, which, you know, we most people will agree was morally correct and did a good job. So the principles of sanctions have been you know, around for a long time and they work when they're applied. If they would make no sense and no regime, you know, Iran would not want to get them out. Uh, Russia would not want to have uh, its sanctions removed. So when we come to today, since these relations were severed, on the U.S. we have, you know, 11 presidents that have gone through the White House. You know, from all ideological polars, you know, you had uh, President Reagan, you have now President Obama, so you've had a wide spectrum of, you know, different ideological thought in the uh, White House, different Congresses. Beginning in 1959, the electronic uh, revolution began. I mean, you know, when Jack Kilby introduced the integrated circuit, you know, it's known as the microchip, when we launched the electronic revolution. Cuba, there's a lot of the same old, same old. There's the same party that's in power. It's the same dynasty that's in power. The same repression. They didn't take part in the electronic revolution because they were busy making other revolutions across uh, Latin America. So the fact that they internally produce a lot of misery, well, the embargo in the United States has been a, a good scapegoat, but again, it defies a reality and, and really the logic of anybody that understands legitimately how economics works to be able to blame uh, the United States. But things changed the fall of Soviet communism. And the Berlin Wall came down in effect, changed the strategy of how not just the Cuban regime would project itself, but their plans for Latin America. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Sao Paulo Forum, which in effect was a forum of the radical left, which is really an invention of Fidel Castro that in effect put together and established a new strategy to promote uh, a new version of, uh, of communism in the uh, Western Hemisphere, where instead of having guerrillas, insurgents fight in the countries, uh, that was no longer feasible because there was no longer Soviet Union to bankroll that. Well, democratic institutions were penetrated, and by way of elections, they would gain power, and once in power, they would at that point perpetualize themselves in power, keeping a, a face of uh, a democracy. The top will call this elective despotism. And in effect, the 21st century socialism is that, which includes Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia and Nicaragua. They have elections, there's an opposition, but the opposition is basically limited as to what it can get into power. This new methodology also redefined private property and redefined the relations of production. And again, this was again something that was not new. Lenin in 1921, four years after gaining power, in effect introduced what was called the new economic policy, which means he opened up the economy to foreign investment and private activity, basically because the Bolshevik regime was going to collapse. So they promoted what many call state capitalism by allowing it to be directed from the top down, and it survived. This was something that fascism realized all along. They, their main argument with, with uh, communists, besides who would be the agent of change, you know, I mean, uh, one said they were the laws of history, and the other said the laws of nature. But 
basically, they had a lot more in common, and the fascists were well ahead, way ahead in the sense that they realized it's better to keep the economy in private hands, but the state will direct you as to what to do, and will decide who can participate and who can't. So, in essence, the economy would serve the political interest, and it did so extremely well. Well, communists learned that and began to uh, play along those rules. China in 1978 began that course, and if any of you listen to uh, the, Chinese lead, the Chinese leader at that time, Deng Xiaoping, his arguments. This is all basically, I mean, the, the China model is socialism with Chinese characteristics, which essentially is a liberalized economy, but a Leninist state in power. Why? Because they realized that private property and market economy works, but that it can commingle with tyranny for tyranny's advantage. So this new methodology, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Cuba opened up to this as well. This that we're seeing now, this is nothing new. Cuba, since 1993, has opened itself up for foreign investment, foreign tourism. It had a dollar economy for many years, which is something that even other Latin American countries don't have. I mean, they've stopped it now, but for many years they operated with dollars as well. Tourists have flooded, businesses have flooded uh, Cuba since then. So this hybrid economy, in effect, has produced something that also emulates China, but in much greater proportions. 70% of the Cuban economy, 70% is run by the Cuban military. In fact, the biggest hotel chain in Latin America <coughs> owned by a Latin American entity is Cuban, Gaesa, which is the con military conglomerate that owns the tourist sector. All right. So, you can't equate what we understand as, as, a, as a free economy or the free enterprise system here and think that that has uh, an equal status in Cuba. For the last eight years, out of the last eight, eight years, six of them, the United States was the main exporter of food to Cuba. The main exporter, Cuba's main source of food acquisition was purchases from the United States. So, you know, and this is with the embargo existing. So, the notion that the U.S. has been starving, that, you know, they refused to sell articles is is completely a, a myth. In fact, this has been so strategically planned by the Cuban regime that when the negotiations began with the Obama administration 18 months prior to the declaration of the relations, Cuba stopped literally buying food from the United States. Now, why do they do that? Well, because they're saying, well, you know, we can no longer keep buying, we want credit. Which was, in essence, their interest always. But buying the, the foodstuffs first was a very smart move because it creates a political lobby to open up those doors. The Cuban regime has serious challenges with the relations with the United States if an administration decides to fully uh, analyze the scope First, Communist Cuba is a pathological violator of human rights. But that, also, that could be an understatement when you take into account the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Courts categorization for crimes against humanity. It lists 11 crimes that are considered crimes against humanity. Cuba habitually violates four of those systematically. One, imprisonment arbitrary imprisonment for political reasons, two, torture, three, murder, and four, forced deportation. This is a customary practice of the Castro regime, and its tremendous impact on public opinion to try to 
make that disappear is a constant, but the fact is that it's there, and this is a major challenge for the, the regime. The issue of slave trade in the workplace. We all hear, and, and this, the regime promotes itself as having, uh, you know, being a powerhouse in the medical field, graduating all those students. Yet, all Cuban medical personnel that goes anywhere in the world, Africa, Latin America, anywhere, they charge. They charge money. This is the second biggest entry of funds for the Castro regime. And they confiscate 90% of what they charge. So when you see a Cuban brigade in Haiti working, they're not there for selfless reasons. The United Nations is paying the Castro regime. And the Castro regime pockets 90% of what they pay. This is an undeniable fact. Now, why do these countries allow it? Well, those Cuban doctors may go in places that other doctors, national doctors, don't want to go to. Take Brazil, for example. A lot of doctors may not want to go inside the rural areas. Well, so I, I can understand if you put all ethical considerations aside why that may interest you know, the governor of Brazil to allow you know, to pay for this service because they can't get doctors to want to go into those areas. And why would a Cuban want to do that? Well, because even though they're getting skimmed 90% of what they're paying, they're still earning more than they would in Cuba, number one. Number two, they have access to merchandise that they don't have in Cuba. And it's not because that, couldn't, that merchandise couldn't be brought into Cuba. It can. Again, Cuba goes to Panama in its, in its free trade zone, and they can go anywhere. In fact, if you go to the hotels in Havana, you'll find American products everywhere that are brought in by this way. So why do they go? Well, because it is more feasible for them to buy something in Haiti or Brazil or Venezuela than to uh, be a doctor in Cuba. So the regime monopolizes on this and in effect has, in 21st century terms, a slave trade and there have been successful cases that have won in, in court against Cuban companies. Cuba also has the problem, as I mentioned, $7 billion in confiscated property. It also has over $2 billion that has been stolen from American taxpayers and credit card companies met it by way of Medicare fraud that is being laundered in Cuba. Over $2 billion worth. You have fugitives that have killed American policemen that are in Cuba. And you have Cuba's participation in the drug trade. And who's promoting the relations between the United States and Cuba outside of the uh, Obama administration? Well, obviously, the Cuban dictatorship has a clear interest because of its dilemma, high cost maintenance, low productivity. It needs funds. It can no longer depend on Venezuelan oil, which has essentially for the last decade uh, bankrolled uh, the Castro regime. It can't keep depending on it, especially with falling oil prices. So they need to go uh, and make terms with the United States. You have commercial interests that have no consideration for uh, ethical or human rights issues. Absolutely none. Uh, Unfortunately, this is not, you know, limited just to the Cuban case. I mean, you know, China, Vietnam, and a whole bunch of other places that have no respect for human rights, and uh, American businesses go there. And again, business is uh, amoral. In other words, it's, it's designed to make a profit. It's designed, their job is, you know, to make the stockholders happy. That's, that's something that one can understand. It is the governments, though, the political class, that should establish thresholds of morality Otherwise, we can justify any slave system. And the third group, there are decent people that truly believe that trade and relations could bring democracy. I know many of them, and I argue with many of them, but there are people, good people, that truly believe that that'll work. 
But the truth is, this, the relations, is strictly about economics. That is all that's on the table. There is nothing there. There is no uh, talk about, uh, you know, will democracy come, human rights, labor law rights, absolutely nothing. It's all about economics. The regime is promoting this because it needs the sanctions lifted. <coughs> Cuba's removed from the terrorist list. Why do you think that happened? Well, that is a precondition to be able to have access to credit from the Export-Import Bank. The credit export, the, the, the Export-Import Bank is essentially a Fannie Mae for exporters. In other words, if an exporter, if an American exporter wants to sell a certain product to Cuba and it wants that loan guaranteed, it could apply to the Export-Import Company and see if they will in effect, guarantee that loan. In other words, if Cuban regime does not pay, well, then the U.S. taxpayer will pay by way of that guarantee. It's, it's designed to promote, you know, export and do good for the American economy. But the interest of the Castro regime is that added benefit of having the loan guaranteed by uh, the United States. And being on the terrorist list does not qualify you uh, for that. We're seeing a libertarian argument by many. Well, Americans have the free, you know, free right to travel here, to travel here, to do this, to do that. But this argument is being made by people that believe in statism, people that, on the other hand, promote policies that is really, you know, geared for the, the, the collective. I mean, certainly, you know, this administration is, 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 is no friend of libertarian causes. And that's not a critique of, of the administration per se, but the argument that, well, it's to facilitate, you know, a freer trade, in essence, in essence, contradicts a lot of its other policies, a lot of other issues. And there's flamboyantly abstract language of, you know, engagement. You know, engagement, but engagement with who? With whom are we engaging? engaging? Liberty and democracy will not be advanced by the relations. And there's a simple reason why. It's a qualitative reason, uh, reason based on the type of dictatorship that is in Cuba. Generally speaking, there are authoritarian dictatorships and totalitarian dictatorships. The basic difference Authoritarian dictatorships are dictatorships, they're cruel, they control the political sphere, but they don't bother to mess with the economy. They don't care about having social control. In other words, there are private schools, public schools, generally citizens can leave, come, businesses, you know, they just want to control the political aspect. The rest, they don't get concerned about. Totalitarian dictatorships do control the economy and do control the social sphere. In places like that, generally, you cannot escape the control of the state. And there's a big difference between one and the other in regards to how will commercial relations impact. In the political science, there's something called the modernization theory. Its principal architect was a Seymour Martin Lipset, and basically it goes like this. It says, well, as a country modernizes and progresses, the business class will put pressure on the political class to democratize. That, that's essentially what you know, modernization uh, theory says. And it has worked in Taiwan, for example, in South Korea in Brazil, in Greece, in Spain. But these cases that I've mentioned were authoritarian dictatorships. They were not totalitarian. The same scenario of trade, we look at China, we look at Vietnam. No democracy in sight. 
because of the notion of civil society. In other words, society, everything that's non-governmental. In authoritarian dictatorships, civil society does not disappear. It continues to coexist even though there's a dictatorship, which means that there's more room to express yourself, there's more room to challenge the regime. In totalitarian dictatorships, civil society does not exist. Zero. Absolutely zero. In fact, in Cuba, they don't even call the private sector private. They call it the non-state sector. They don't even call it private. And that other 30% of the economy that is not owned by the regime, in effect, is controlled indirectly by the regime. Because if you have anything from a little ice cream stand, if you pronounce yourself politically against the regime, you are out of business. And you're lucky if you're not in jail. So this control, this mechanism of control, that in effect, if you want to prosper, if you want to, you know, get ahead. Remember, in the authoritarian model, you don't need to suck up to the uh, dictatorship. As long as, you know, you want about your business. In Cuba, no, you do. You do have to show a certain acceptance of the norm. Otherwise, and not just Cuba, in, same thing in China. The, the Chinese Communist Party has more members that are entrepreneurs than intellectuals or farmers or workers. Entrepreneurs compose the largest membership in the Chinese Communist Party. Why do you think that is? It is because it is the only way to success fully advanced. You may not, now I'm, I'm not suggesting that all the Chinese entrepreneurs may believe in, in communism, but that's irrelevant. It really is irrelevant because they are not challenging the political system and sticking to whatever instructions the party gives it as far as where the economy, what decisions to make, and so forth. There is not one case, in case you have any doubt, not one case, there's not one example of empirical evidence of a totalitarian regime that by way of relations, commercial relations, has blossomed into democracy. Not one. You will not find it. What the Cuban regime is looking for is, in the near future, the model of what can be termed as Asian communism, in other words, China or Vietnam, where you have a liberalized economy, but you have a Leninist dictatorship, a one-party political dictatorship, and they coexist perfectly. There is no, the notion of many years ago that, well, no, no, capitalism cannot exist with the uh, with tyranny. That has been proven a myth by China's successful entry into an economic powerhouse and a model dictatorship. They have shown the way that it can be done. Vietnam has followed that example beautifully. And has there been material progress? Yes, undisputably. But the relations with Cuba is not being sold as, well, Fine, you know, let's leave the dictatorship there, but let's try to, you know, help the people materially. That's not being sold, that's not being told. We're being lied to <coughs> or expected to believe that somehow Cuba's gonna be an anomaly and will defy all empirical evidence that we have up to date as far as a, a political model of total domination going into a democracy because of its uh, commerce between its citizens and a free country. If we follow Obama's logical fallacy, and, and when he talked about the relations, he said 
Why insist on repeating a failed policy and expect a different outcome? Uh, that's what he said. That was you know, the base of the thrust. Why follow a failed policy and repeat a different outcome and expect a different outcome? Well, if that is true, then I tell those that favor the relations with, between Cuba and the United States, why follow a failed policy? Because in effect, with China for 37 years, that has been the case, and there's no democracy in sight. In Vietnam, it has been 29 years, and there's no democracy in sight. So why do we think that what hasn't worked in China and hasn't worked in Vietnam will work in Cuba? So if the sanctions was wrong, well, this is also wrong. When you add the fact that Cuba already for 22 years has had a hybrid economy, has liberalized its economy, has allowed free enterprise, has allowed foreign investors, has allowed tourists to go in, and still no democracy, well then, this is more of the same that's been tried and has failed if the parameter we see, we're seeking to cross is democracy. If it is not, then, then sell it as a material well betterment for the people and just throw in the towel that, hey, tyranny is here to stay, let's accept it. There will be no mojito revolution in Cuba via economics. There will not be. Because again, capitalism is perfectly compatible with despotism. And this is irrelevant of ideological swing. You can, you know, if you look at dictatorships from the right or from the left, they have, could both coexist comfortably with a, a capitalist uh, system. And I think the biggest problem of the relation between the U.S. And, and Cuba is that it is being promoted by the decent sector. Remember I said there were three, people, three groups that were interested the Castro regime, commercial interests that really would trade with anyone, and you have people that general, genuinely believe that democracy will get there. All right, that third group, all right, I think there is a cause and effect problem. Because in Cuba, the issue is not economics. The problem is ethical, the problem is political. Economic determinism. And I can't stress that enough, in a totalitarian dictatorship, is a mute point. And I just want to go through some of the rationalization before concluding that I'm sure you've all heard. Remember the the people-to-people -people thing, that all people-to-people, that's going to work. Well, first of all, again, it's delusional because there is no civil society in Cuba. That's number one. Number two, tourists have been going, European, Canadian, Latin American, since 1993, in huge amounts. In fact, China, if we want to you know, go back to the China model, receives 65 million tourists a year. It's the second tourist destination in the world. You know, democracy is nowhere to be found. So tourists are an irrelevant factor in promoting a democracy. The notion of, well, it'll, this will introduce new ideas. Cuba's problem is not about ideas. It's about space to promote ideas that Cubans know very well. And again, if the idea that, and, 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 and these are, I, I hear this from people that, you know, have dedicated a life to, to challenging the regime and somehow feel that this could, could do it. And, you know, these are positions they think, well, this is going to infuse new ideas, this is going to infuse a new way of thinking, but I go, but this is, you know, Cubans are not alien to certain universal truths, I mean, you know, uh, it's easy to conclude that if you speak against a regime and you get, you know, hit in the head, that's not right. So you don't need, you know, an infusion of idea to tell you that that is the way to go. Internet connectivity. This is another, you know, uh, point that's being made. But again, to believe this, you're dependent on the ignorance of the person in front of you because 
Sprint, since 1996, offered the regime to build their internet system. They were interested. Spanish telecommunication companies, Italian communication companies, have done the same thing. China has an excellent uh, ability to build internet connections. There are Vietnamese companies that do the same. The Castro regime has been issued. Google offered basically to do it for free. The Castro regime said no. Why? Because this is about two things as far as internet connection. One, control, and two, money. We hear that this, the problem is a thing of the past. We even heard you know, Pope Francis say this. This is morally repulsive because that same dictatorship that took power 56 years ago is in power today. So this is not an issue of the past. This is not just an issue that, of two democratic nations that were arguing over some border dispute and it's time to make peace. No. This is an issue that there is a regime that flagrantly violates the most fundamental human rights and continues to do so. And are we as a society supposed to just accept that and say, well, good for you? And again, the notion of well, the embargo hasn't worked. Again, it's the same logical fallacy. What are you upholding the, the embargo to? Because again, you've had different administrations that have taken different stances, tightened it, loosened it. Embargo worked great in South Africa in promoting a regime change that you know most people would applaud. Then, if the embargo hasn't worked, again, the engagement with China, with Vietnam, hasn't worked. So you know, what do we try now? And lastly, before concluding, the notion that, well, we trade with China, or we trade with you know, Vietnam, or we trade with Saudi Arabia. Well, two wrongs don't make a right. In other words, the fact that U.S. policy uh, is not correct with a regime, whether it's China or Vietnam, is not correct with Cuba either. To conclude, the relations is all about money. A lot of money, and a dictatorship can give you something that no democracy can, and that is it can give you a piece of the pie, it can give you a labor force that will not strike, that will not challenge you, and in essence, you have the ability to make a lot of money not be challenged, not be have problems with environment laws or labor laws, and not have competition. Because when a dictatorship gives you a slice of the sector of an economy, you're going to operate extremely uh, comfortable. This predatory opportunism, if one truly believes in human rights and in liberty, must be challenged. Democracy can't be separated uh, from liberty, and if this is accepted, if this relationship between the United States and the Castro regime is accepted without any strong denunciations of human rights violations, of conditioning on certain aspects, this is damaging much more than, you know, than, uh, than the Cuban people. The Inter-American uh, Democratic Charter, which was a charter ch signed in 2001 by most of the democratic states in Latin America and the United States, in effect stated that democracy was a standard and that no dictatorship would be accepted. Now, why would they sign that? Well, what's the purpose of that? Well, very simple. It's to set parameters to make sure that dictators and dictators-to-be understand that they're going to pay a price if they cross certain thresholds. When President Obama opens the door to communist Cuba and does not publicly make the policy of the United States a condition of respect for certain human rights, of democracy, in, built into the American law, sanctions would be lifted immediately
if political prisoners are released, if political parties are allowed to legally operate, if independent unions are allowed. I mean, this is not, you know, it's not even asking for the Castros to physically walk out. It's basically, you know, asking for conditioning certain minimum things that any civilized society has. So why would that be a problem? Why would that be a problem in asking of a country that you're establishing diplomatic relations, that you broke diplomatic relations because it stole a lot of money from property of your citizens and it and basically invaded a lot of the neighbors that you have and promoted subversive movement. I mean, what is the challenge? So I think that in looking at this and understand that democracy is but a little island in a sea of historical despotism. It's a small experiment. The United States is the most successful, consistent democracy, but it is vulnerable. And it is vulnerable when ethical considerations of basic rights, of natural rights, you know, fundamental rights that are in the Declaration of Independence, that are in the United Nations Declaration, that are, are in the Organization of American States, which, which basically states that liberty is a fundamental right and that no government or regime has the right to take that away from you. If one is to uphold democracy and not make issues with violations of these rights, democracy is in danger. And I want to conclude by just reading something that uh, Oriana Falacci, the Italian journalist, uh, said. There are moments in life when keeping silent becomes a fault and speaking an obligation, a civic duty, a moral challenge, a categorical, a categorical imperative from which we cannot escape. End of quote. And I hope that in your, you know, education, in your interaction with other people on this issue, that you remember to exclude the notion of human rights and liberty for Cuba, in effect, makes you a complicity in that dictatorship. Thank you and God bless you. because that is also something that, uh, you know, another rationalization factor that's, that's, that's thrown out as well. You know, Cuban people should be allowed to settle this for themselves. Well, that would be wonderful, but for that to happen, Cuba would have to be a democracy. Because, in fact, Cuba now is not alone. I mean, Cuba is supported by Venezuelan oil. It is supported by Iranian intelligence. Cuba is part of a transnational network that operates in full uh, agreement with 21st century socialist countries, Venezuela, Ecuador, Nicaragua, Bolivia. Uh, Iran is part and has, you know, huge intelligence operations in Latin America. China has invested enormously in these regions. So Cuba is not, you know, the Castro regime is not alone. And in fact, the truth is to, to expect that, you know, such people alone, any, any people could make a, a historical process like that happen defies history. I mean, South America would not be independent had Napoleon not been at war with Spain. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you cannot divorce international factors. And to believe that somehow, you know, the Cuban opposition or the Cuban people that would be willing to risk it. And you've got to understand the, the price that one pays in a country like Cuba to be singled out. First of all, your job is state-sponsored. Even if you're working in a foreign hotel, that job, the state got you, not the hotel, because hiring is done through a state agency. So that precious job that you have, because of the fact that you're going to be exposed to people with hard currency, would immediately cease to exist if the regime sees that you are part of the opposition. If you're studying a, a coveted career, you lose that opportunity. You cannot, if you wanted to study law, forget it. Because that is, you know, one of the uh, one of the many uh, careers that the regime allows for people that are in line with their ideology. And again, uh, how does it determine? Well, it determines by seeing that you're not contesting their political power. So this would be ideal in a in a democratic society that is feasible. In other words, you know, in, in, in the U.S., we could truly, you know, determine, well, you know, who do we want in, at the helm of the White House? You know, there, I mean, we can critique the system, which has a lot of, you know, places to be critiqued. But nonetheless, American society can, you know, exercise. It doesn't need anything else. But in processes where there is a dictatorship, usually dictatorships operate in alliances, so, you know, who's going to be in alliance with the Cuban people? So that alternative uh, is, not, is not feasible as long as Cuba's a dictatorship. Um, do you believe that the Castro administration is a cult of personality, and do you think that the Cubans will be able to transfer power within the Communist Party after that regime um, serves up? Where are you from? Uh, New Jersey. No, no, but I'm saying... You born in New Jersey? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't speak a word of Korean. I'm sorry. No, no. Well, because you, you've asked a, a brilliant question, and I and I really thank you for it, because in essence you're 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 touching upon one of the main concerns of the of the regime, and that is its type of leadership coordination. Max Weber, the sociologist. Divine, di de define different types of, uh, of leadership uh, categorizations and the sultanistic type of dictatorship with a high cult of personality in effect has its biggest challenge when that leader is closer to death and that is the challenge transferring the legitimacy from the leader to the party in China, Deng Xiaoping timed the transfer from Mao to the Chinese Communist Party with Mao Zedong dying, because he knew that this was crucial. And that is a test of power, and that is a major concern for the Castro regime. This is precisely why they are running into disagreement with the U.S., because they believe, and I think rightly so, that they're not going to find another administration that's going to be a more hospitable to uh, this type of, uh, of relationship. But that is precisely what you uh, talked about. And, and Max Weber uh, called that the routinization of charisma. In other words, the charismatic notion which in in, in, in religion and theology, basically, you know, charisma is that you have a, a certain aura that is supernatural. And in the sense that he was using it, it didn't disengage itself totally from that, from that belief. In other words, a charismatic leader uh, needs to transmit to the people that he is invisible, that he is sort of Superman. And this explains why, you know, <coughs> Mao was filmed swimming a river that was very rough. So people can see, oh, this explains why films of when Fidel Castro fell have in Cuba disappeared. Because this display, you know, a certain weakness and images 
utmost importance. So that routinization of charisma that Max Weber called, which is transferring from the figure of a cult of personality, charismatic leader, to the party, is a difficult stage for a dictatorship that has a leadership style like that. And that is precisely why, since Castro is still alive, that it faces its main challenge. So, you know, thank you for, uh, for bringing that up. And, and I don't know, that is the variable that will truly uh, be the greatest test for the Cuban dictatorship in its survival. I would have liked to have seen that happen with sanctions in place for the simple fact that I think the Cuban regime would have been most enticed to open up itself politically had the sanctions been in place and had they been faced with the, you know, the, the fact that Castro was dying. But they're trying to precisely do that change of authority from, you know, leader to party. And we're in, we're in the midst of that. You want to direct the questions? I'm sorry. I, I, no, no. I think he was, and then. Okay, I think you were next, and then you, and then you. Um, can I have the microphone to like? Yeah. Kind of sick. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm Michael. I'm from Miami, Florida. Too. I'm from Hialeah, the dentist. Cuban place in South Florida. My sister goes to FIU too. She's getting her master's. Um, so, so I just have like one question. So I was just wondering like why the U.S. right now um, is kind of like focusing their energy, well not all their energy, but like their energy on this embargo, because um, this embargo was set, as you said, 56 years ago, one year after Fidel Castro had had risen and seized his power, and one year before Obama was born. I, I searched up that fact a little ago. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering, like, why are they doing that now? Because, like, yeah, they're trying to make this seem as if it's going to go through. But you said Obama, like, you said Obama said, you know, they just keep on trying and they're not succeeding. Um, they're, like, bringing up that new embassy in Havana, like, just to try to, like, strengthen this, you know, this idea of, yeah, this embargo, we're gonna, you know, take it out, but, I don't know, like, I see this issue as, like, just um, something to bring up to strengthen, like, not only Obama's, um, like, strength as president, because, you know, he really hasn't done anything, um, but also, like, like, president, oh, not president, but, like, presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, because, you know, she spoke at FIU, um, about all this to try to, I guess, like strengthen her powers because she saw that Obama had like 50% of like the Cuban American votes, and my family didn't vote for him. But um, <laughs> so I'm just asking, like, why now? You know. Well, uh, I think all all presidents, you know, want a, you know a certain legacy, and, and you know, on on a personal level. Uh, my, 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 my main problem with the initiative of Obama well, on, on this issue is the fact that I truly question if the, the promotion of democracy is at the forefront when that's not even an issue that's raised. You know, as, as an, when you negotiate something, if you're going to negotiate, and obviously, you know, communist Cuba has more to win than, than the United States in this. I mean, you know. Certainly, the United States is not in a position of, uh, you know, economic uh, collapse. People are not in, in living in the misery that they live in Cuba. So, you know, you you would think that uh, the United States isn't being in a much favorable position, being you know the most solid democracy in the world, would promote uh, a certain amount of, you know, uh, democracy, human rights, and so forth. And uh, I don't see that. I. This is a strategic move because the president is essentially, by way of executive order, opening up and weakening the embargo as much as he can because it has an objective of vascularizing special interest. Now, what I mean by that is by opening up and allowing cruise ships to go, well, those are commercial interests of American companies. <laughs> 
want to go. Well, those commercial interests are going to go to Washington and, and tell a congressman that may have not have supported, uh, that may have supported the sanctions, it may not have supported lifting it, to say, hey, come on, let's do it. You know, I mean, we give money to your campaign. This is the idea. It's sort of wetting the appetite. It's the same strategy that the, the, the uh, Castro regime uses in buying a whole bunch of American agricultural products, paying cash for it, and then all of a sudden they start talking about stabbing diplomatic relations and they stop buying. And they, when they ask, well, why did you, are you not buying? He says, well, you know, we don't get credit from you. Look, we're, the Chinese are going to give us credit. Well, the Chinese would have given you credit before. But there's a reason for that, and that is because, again, you, is, you successfully established uh, an, a lobby of commercial interest in Washington with existing, you know, uh, trade. So that is, uh, in, you know, in my estimation, the strategy of uh, the Obama administration is moving it as fast as possible, because I believe that he also feels that, irrelevant of who wins the White House, even if it would be uh, a Democratic candidate, that they're not going to be as as moving forward as as he has. I think there will be a greater sensitivity to gross human rights violations if it were, you know, some of the other Democratic candidates and much more so, you know, Republican candidates. Uh, President Obama has not, you know, demonstrated really a disturbance uh, uh, with that. Neither has Pope Francis, you know. And, and it's not because he doesn't like politics. He certainly gets involved in politics, you know, but he chooses his politics. And probably his biggest you know, difference is that, well, you know, the Cuban regime is an atheist state. If it were an atheist state, if it were a Christian state, he probably would, you know, open-heartedly support a lot of that. And, and, and part of this is the rhetoric. The rhetoric that the Cuban regime projects. In other words, it projects a language that seduces a lot of people. You know, it talks about uh, equality, yet what it really is is a caste system that if you're well politically connected, you are well off not just financially, but you are above the law. All right? You can basically do what you want as long as the regime feels that you are good to them. Everything is excusable because they make the law. If Bill Gates violates the law here and it's a serious enough, serious enough offense, he can go to jail. Well, that doesn't happen in a country like uh, Cuba or China or North Korea. You know, if you are well connected, that will be put under the table because th there is no rule of law. Okay, I think he had a question. He had a question. You, you go next. You go next. So my question is, um, if we suppose the goal of opening up relations with Cuba is to bring about democracy and it's not just an economic um, ploy, then what alternatives um, do we have to lifting the embargo? Because um, you mentioned South Africa as an example several times, and I see the situation sort of different than that. In South Africa, there's more international support for an embargo, and in this one, it's sort of a unilateral approach from the United States. So I guess what alternatives do we have to an embargo in enforcing democratic change? Well, and you're absolutely right about, you know, the, the, the embargo against, you know, racist South Africa was international and that and that's good. And that was, you know, very successfully executed. And the problem is that, you know, the the Castro regime has been since day one working on a, a massive public relations campaign, which is something that you know, a racist regime in Africa did not do. Uh, this is uh, consistent with Cuban communism in that the, the Cuban experiment in effect was the main supporter of what we now call the new left. In other words, it opened its doors, intellectuals, to anyone that essentially was, you know, anti-capitalist, 
it was much, much less discriminatory. Uh, for example, the Soviet Union, in its um, elite thinking, had more of a closed-door policy, same as the Chinese. Yet, when, when Castro comes to power, it had a completely different vision as far as uh, the making of the new man. And that uh, attracted you know, a lot of uh, elites from all walks of life. Some of them you know, changed their mind. Jean-Paul Sartre, for example, uh, later on critiqued the, uh, you know, the, the Castro regime. But that was after many years of lending it uh, tremendous legitimacy. And this has worked enormously. Cuba brings in a lot of students to study over there. But this is not done with a benevolent purpose alone. This is done much more so to establish ambassadors that will go back to their country and will clean the image of the repression of human rights violations. The fact that there's no liberty. I mean, you know, it's very difficult to defend a system that for 56 years has had the same family in power. Yet they're able to do that. Why? Because they work completely through the notion of multilateralism that they promote, for example, in, in, in the American, the Western Hemisphere, with particularly with a lot of the small uh, Caribbean countries because they count as a lot of numbers, there's a lot of numbers there. And then they can haul votes against uh, condemnation for human rights violations. They do that all across Africa. They do that uh, for years. And, and a lot of these states have a certain, they may not particularly uh, like the Cuban model, but there's a certain level of debt because of the fact that Cuba invested in them years ago, you see. So they have a, you know, the ability to project an image that even though, you know, no serious thinker can say, well, no, they don't violate human rights or, or that's a democracy or, you know, no. But yet they still support it and they will not do anything to, to condemn it. So that's why, you know, in, in, on the international basis it hasn't worked. But I think there's really been no consistent policy by the United States to promote uh, the sanctions against the Castro regime. There, there, there really hasn't. And, you know, if, if the leader of the free world does not uh, do that, and again, the, the notion that people are, you know, the policemen of the world, well, if the U.S. had not taken the position of, if not policemen, at least, you know, assisting the policemen of the world, we would probably all be speaking German or Russian. So I think that, you know, there is, uh, a, a, a fact of uh, international player that if the United States does not have, it'll be fooled by others. And again, we see that in Syria where, you know, Putin, Putin has a position today that he didn't have uh, prior to Obama's, you know, red pink line establishment that uh, he didn't uh, come across. Well, that was quickly filled, that vacuum was quickly filled by uh, by uh, Putin. So I think, you know, there's got to be political will uh, in Washington if they really wanted to promote that. Well, I just uh, had a question. Earlier you mentioned that like, the opening up of economic relations does not lead to, you know, advances. I'm sorry, uh, earlier you said that the opening up of economic relations does not lead to advances in liberty and democracy. I failed to catch how. Uh, do you mind just explaining that a little more? You, you failed to catch how that I didn't understand did why, how econo how like opening up economic advances did not lead to advances in liberty. Well, there are close to a billion Chinese that will you know tell you that uh, there's no liberty and democracy in China, and that has opened up uh, trade. The, you know, trade will only promote democracy in authoritarian dictatorships. I mean, you know, if, if we're if, if your question is, and, and what I'm trying to, you know, maintain is based on what we have as historical evidence, I mean, you know, if we say, well, could it happen? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, if we're going into the realm of possibilities of the unknown, that's a different issue. But based on evidence, there's not one concrete case of a totalitarian dictatorship 
that by way of commercial uh, relations with the free world has uh, somehow uh, been contagious in the democratic uh, field. Yeah, I was just curious as to why uh, that never happened. Okay, well, uh, the reason is because what you develop is you a society that is domesticated by the system. In other words, if you want to open a restaurant in Cuba, right, and you want to be able to operate that, and you have the ability to make, you know, especially, you know, the way people live in Cuba to be very well, well, you're going to have to uh, not project yourself as being against the regime or against wanting any political change because you will be out of business. Access to money typically has to come from abroad, from, you know, Cubans living outside. If you are able to travel as you can now, back and forth, and, you know, you come to the United States, you get money, you make money, you go back to Cuba for your restaurant, you really have no interest in talking about politics. None at all. If you want to stay healthy and, and run your business prosperously, I mean, it makes all the sense in the world. So this is built into the system. You see, it's built into the system that, uh, you know, you do not want to cross the line of, you know, civil liberties or, or political liberties, because otherwise that will nullify your ability to operate in any business venture. So, and I appreciate your bringing up that point because that is is super important to understand that uh, a dictatorship can control an economy. It doesn't have to own the business. By being able to say who can operate and who can't is is enough. And this is not the same comparison as, for example, because some people say, well, you know, in this, you know, you need a license to be a, you know, a plumber in, in a state or something. Well, you know, the, the, the state of Massachusetts is not going to care whether you're, you know, a Democrat or a socialist or, you know, a believer or not believer to give you a plumber's license. It's not going to care. In Cuba, that does matter. If you are contesting political power, you are not allowed to play in the game. Yes, um, I wanted to ask you about, <coughs> because I think you you had um... you have very good uh, convincing points of why the actions of Obama administration were not are not going to be beneficial to the Cuban people in the long term, at least not in the short term. So I wanted to ask you uh, if you had the executive power to do what Obama did or otherwise, what, what, what other actions would you take? Because I see that the, the people opposing this, they say this is not the best course of action, but they don't give you an alternative. And as somebody that lived in Cuba for 23 years, I, I really think the people of Cuba are waiting for something to change. And keeping the status quo was almost unacceptable at this point. So I, want, I wanted to hear your thoughts on what alternative ways do we have to approach this. I want to bring a point that's very interesting because it's true that this has, you know, uh, given certain expectations, you know, lifted expectations to the Cuban people. Yet, ironically, the amount of people that are leaving Cuba is in record high. More people are leaving Cuba since the United States and the Castro regime established relations than before, which tells you that there's not a lot of confidence in, not the United States, but in the promises of liberty, of being able to function successfully without political interference. So, because you would think, well, if, you know, everybody must be, you know, if people really believe that this was the way to go, then nobody will be leaving, everybody would want to stay, and I mean, you hear on, on a lot of these uh, programs, all, you know, all the millionaires that are going to be made in Cuba, why would anybody want to leave then 
they're going to be, be able to become a millionaire into the U.S., which is, you know, so full of uh, such a competitive society. Well, they leave because they don't... See, they've seen this before in the sense that reforms come and then reforms are reversed. Because from the regime standpoint, it's all about survival. It's not a coincidence that Cubans now, which for years the regime did not allow Cubans to leave, now it, it basically is complicit into allowing Cubans to leave. The fact, anybody that wants to leave Cuba, if they pay the price, you can go and, and you know, get somebody out, you know, $10,000, $15,000, and you're out. That's it. And this is really an assault on, on an ethical immigration policy that says Cubans have the ability to come here and from the moment that they step into U.S. soil they don't have to wait like other uh, Latin Americans, they're allowed residency right away. I mean, you know, they're given status, preferential status, yet if that's the case then how can they be returning back? So there's a moral inconsistency there that at some point uh, you know, needs to be uh, addressed. But the, the idea that, and, and, I, and I do want to touch on what I would do if I had uh, executive power. But, President Schiller. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I want to stress the other point because one would think, I mean, I, I separate myself and I say, well, if everything, if everybody, because the media is you know, projecting this, there's a lot of hype, you know, Cuban people, a lot of editorials are saying, you know, people are enthusiastic, then one would conclude that nobody would want to leave and yet more people are leaving than before so so this you know brings that to mind but I believe that there's a twofold one reverse the policies of, uh, of the uh, diplomatic relations the Castro regime has done nothing to merit its diplomatic recognition that is a legitimacy that is being given to a dictatorship that has not changed anything. The notion of reconciliation, all right, remember it's part of the, one of the Catholic sacraments, requires two things. One, that you, you know, uh, stop doing what you're doing that is wrong, and that you ask for forgiveness, that you, you know, are truly sorry that you've been doing that. And Reconciliation is not possible if that act of barbarity continues. So the notion that somehow this is a thing of the past will be a thing of the past if all of a sudden, you know, the Castro regime will say, that's it, you know, we've had a, you know, like Constantine, you know, we want to, that's it, stop persecuting the Cubans, the, the Christians, well, you know, the Castro regime said, that's it, we're tired of being tyrants, we're going to change policy. But that has not happened, that's not going to happen. So I think these actions need to be reversed. I think an immigration policy, you cannot have a policy that favors Cubans coming in to a country. And I understand fully that it's difficult to separate the economic from the political in a, in a country like Cuba because of the totalitarian regime, the political inundates every aspect. But you cannot favor a Cuban over a Colombian and then want the Cuban to have the same right as the Colombian and be able to go back immediately because that Colombian maybe had to wait many years to be able to come to the U.S. as a legal uh, president. So that is, you know, a, an ethical question I think needs to, to be addressed. But the sanctions can work and the idea is not that, oh, you're going to starve the Cuban people and that they will revolt. No, 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 no. The idea is that the regime will seek to truly reform, uh, particularly its political aspect, because it has no other uh, recourse. North Korea is in business because it's a dependency of China. If China were, would not uh, give it the huge amounts of money that it does, the North Korean regime would collapse. These regimes maintain itself not because of popular support, but because they're very successful in implementing terror. Uh, 
and terror costs money to implement. And if you starve the regime, denying it resources to do that, it's going to have to truly make uh, concessions <coughs> on its dictatorial system. Yeah, the issue with that is for how long and at the expense of what? It's still, I, I just realize sometimes the opposition hates more a hundred Cuban people in the government than a hundred million people that are suffering for right now 56 years. And, and, this and this government could keep going for easily 10 more years and keep starving the people if nobody does anything. So. See, the, the point that you raise and, and I, I would like to see this issue debated along the lines that you've stated, because then what we're really asking for is, okay, a willing to sell for economic betterment, but dictatorship permanency? Or do we want the whole thing? Do we want, you know, betterment, but, but you know, with liberty as well? My biggest problem is that this is not being sold as that. This is being sold as being beneficial for the Cuban people, that democracy will come, and that is a lie. That will not happen. You know, excusing and imponderable, again, you know, what, what the issue that you raised, the death of, of the Castro, that transfer from the, a major concern, and